Awesome. Everybody give some love to uh, our speakers as they uh, join us on stage. Uh, we have the co-founder at ClearScope, the leading SEO content optimization tool. Uh, he was the 500 startups marketer in residence responsible for SEO. He's consulted for DoorDash, Strava, All Trails, and other high growth companies playing uh, and played online poker professionally and uh, co-owned a barbecue restaurant franchise. Please give a warm welcome to Bernard Wong. Oh, Thank we got you. some Pikachu's in the chat. I love it. Um, and we have the author of Product-Led SEO. And he's a growth advisor to high growth startups like Coinbase, Gusto, Mixpanel, and Quora. And he was previously the director of growth at SurveyMonkey. Please give a warm welcome to Eli Schwartz. Guys. Awesome. All right, just to give you all a little bit of a, the lay of the land here. We're going to go through some high level questions uh, about SEO and kind of the, the state of, of, of SEO today. Um, and then we're going to get into more tactical um, uh, adv advice, more specific things around SEO, um, ask about some resources, uh, and then maybe get to some audience questions if we have some time. You can use the Q&A function uh, in the chat in order to ask questions that uh, we may have time to get to at the end. But let's go ahead and kick, kick things off. Um, at, at a high level, um, you know, when do you know that SEO is even a right channel to invest in? Uh, like, is SEO for everyone? And who should actually be paying attention to this? Uh, well, I'll start with, with, with Eli. SEO is not for everyone. I mean, you, you, billboards aren't for everyone. And even if billboards are for everyone, the right billboards are, are not for everyone. You know, there was a, a company I worked for and when I was working there, we were we were begging them to do out of home advertising, to advertise on buses and, and subways and you know those kinds of things. And they never wanted to do it. They said it wasn't worthwhile. And I was recently in New York, and they finally did take out a billboard, but 80 miles from New York City. So that that was a waste of time and completely useless. And SEO is kind of the same thing. You shouldn't just do SEO because you should do SEO. Like you would need to have like a a user story or persona or reason someone would want to search for you and, and click through and buy from you. And if they're not going to, it's like taking out a billboard 80 miles from New York City. You've checked the box, but you're wasting your money. You know, it, again, it has to make sense. And you know, many companies that I look at that they've done SEO, they've gotten no ROI from it and they're complaining about that lack of ROI. And that's because it's not a fit. Who, who are, like, give, give me some examples. Like who are those companies that are just like, they think it's a fit, but it's just clearly not. It's not that they think it's a fit. They it just CMOs and heads of marketing come in and they think it's something they have to do. So they never really went through that thought process of like, is it a fit? Should I even do this? I find that B2B companies, it doesn't necessarily make sense because that's not how people buy. People buy by you know looking at pricing and looking at fit. They're not Googling, oh, this tool is number one on, on Google. It's going to definitely be the right thing for me. I also find that if something is too innovative, it's also not a fit because there's no demand yet. So you need to go and create that demand and then people search for you. So if you can do a bunch of SEO and I've talked to startups with innovative solutions and they're like, well, we're number one for our brand or we're number one for all these things, but no one's looking. So all that money they've invested in that number one status doesn't help. Got it. Anything to add to that, Bernard? I mean, I feel like Eli, Eli has hit the nail on the head. It's definitely not for everyone. I'm going to, add on to this in a more tactical sense. So at a high level, yes, it's not there for everyone. In a more tactical sense, generally, I would recommend if you can't point to a competitor and say, wow, you know, they're doing really well in organic search. That's what I want to replicate. Chances are SEO is probably not for you. Another great way to understand if SEO is for you is really to just do the paid ads PPC component, right? If you're buying ads on Google where people are searching for things that you care about and you're just scratching your head being like, oh, damn, I can't, I just can't make these unit economics work, then that's another yellow red flag that, okay, maybe SEO is not for you and that's perfectly fine. I'd say the last bit of advice, since I know a lot of y'all are in earlier stages of your growth, company growth, I typically stay away from recommending SEM for seed, even series A startups in general, because a lot of the time you're still finding product market fit. 
And SEO takes a long time, at least in terms of SEO, like time lengths, right? Like six months and you could be out of money. And a lot of, you know, SEO strategies is like six months before you start seeing any sort of semblance of growth or traction. So those are going to be what I boil down the tactical recommendations to. If a competitor is not doing a search strategy and they're really dominant in the space, you know, maybe not for you. If you're really early and, you know, your competitors are doing really well, still maybe not for you because it takes a long time. And if you can't make PPC work, then probably not for you as well. Well, I had to disagree with Bernard right there. If a competitor is not doing SEO, just it doesn't mean that the SEO isn't necessarily a fit. One of the things that I've seen, you know, in my years doing SEO is people are obsessed with competitors. So they copy the competitors' keywords, they copy the competitors' content, they copy the competitors' links. And, you know, I've, I've been in a position where we acquired companies we were competing with, and they would say things like, well, we copied what you were doing. And I was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. This, is, this wasn't intentional. This wasn't a strategy. This is, I didn't even notice it worked. So I don't think it's, a, it's good to start with the competitors as, as your starting point. Sometimes they're just completely wrong. Sometimes they have no idea. Sometimes they're bad at what they're doing. I, I like the idea of really thinking about that user journey. Is the user journey there for search? And is someone going to buy from search? It doesn't matter whether the competitors are doing it. You're smarter than them. Know that. And you should do it. But if there's no user journey and your competitors aren't doing SEO, maybe they are smart and they know that there's no user journey. Definitely. I agree with that. Can't always, can't always believe that your competitors know what, no SEO. And most of them don't, you know, I, that's what I find often is people read a book, they read a blog post and they think they know SEO and they don't, which is a huge area of opportunity for people to actually know SEO and want to do this and don't want to buy a really cool tool like ClearScope. There we go, bringing it full circle. Um, it's, it's some really great points in there. So if, it's, if you're too innovative, probably not a fit. If you can't point to a competitor that's, that's crushing SEO, it may or may not be a fit, I'll say that. Um, you know, if you can't use paid ads to test SEO demand, may not be a fit. Don't have product market fit, may not be a fit. So those are some heuristics that uh, we can take note of um, that may make a difference. Oh. There we go. Um, let me ask you, Bernard, what do you think most experts get wrong about modern SEO? And is there any advice that you keep seeing, you know, year after year, you've been doing this for so long um, that you just wish would go away? Oof, yeah, that's a, that's a tough, tough question. I would say as a general high level observation, I think most experts usually carve out their, their niche in a specific field or aspect of search engine optimization. So in different eras of SEO, you would have seen the rise of the link builder guru or expert. You would have seen the rise of a technical SEO guru or expert. And nowadays you're seeing the rise of the content strategists and um, like high level, like intent quality content focus, like search engine optimization, see their time. And I think that the biggest mistake that I see experts make is that they cling on too dearly to the field that got them popular in the first place and they start seeing a lot of the problems in seo like nails and their specialty is the hammer and so that's probably the the biggest high level mistake is not evolving with the times certainly eli what do you think I like the idea of really thinking about SEO from the top down, from a, from a logical strategic standpoint. And I, I think that too many people get caught up in, in specific things without really thinking about the logic behind it. So as an example, like this is something I've been talking about in presentations forever. Google has autonomous cars. So they have hundreds of autonomous cars. They're licensed as robo-taxis. They don't really do robo-taxis for 
regular people, but they're robo taxi employees. So they drive on the street and they don't kill anybody and they do a pretty good job and they don't cut cars off. Like they behave. That's some high level. A. But then the same company. Now, when people acknowledge that they say Google's doing a lot of smart stuff, but then they, when they think about search, you're like, well, if I got this guest post from, you know, a, a DA 90 site, I'm guaranteed to rank number one on this super competitive term against all my competitors who have actual brands. Like so that logic just falls away. And the same as a technical SEO. It doesn't really matter in the big picture whether your page speed is perfect or your title tags are perfect. I very rarely see any of these technical SEO recommendations amount to actual ROI. So I don't do SEO audits. I've received SEO audits. And you know when I've given SEO audits, no one really acts upon them because you have to prioritize that effort. And, you know, if you say to someone, well, I guarantee you, if you make your site in you know, 10% faster, you get 10% more revenue, they'll probably do it. But if you say, well, your outcome for making your site 10% faster is your site is 10% faster, hard to justify the significant expense that would come from that. So I think when it comes to SEO, it's really important to think about the big picture. Like, does this matter? Do you think Google cares that much about this? Like page speed is something that people harp so much on. But if you would just do a page speed analysis on all of your competitors within a vertical, they're terrible. I mean, so many sites are terrible. They're slow. They're on shared hosting. They're hosted all over the world. That's the way Google looks at things. Google's not on the fly saying, oh, this site is really fast. We're just going to win this. And this site is really slow. But never mind the fact that it's like Amazon and they just don't deserve it because they haven't optimized page speed. Big picture, those things don't matter. Big picture, what Google's trying to do is serve the best answer, serve the best information, not give you know stars and awards as the best SEO. Got it. And so uh, you know what, what I really got from that was all too often people are kind of in the weeds thinking about all right, well if we just make this little tweak here or that little tweak there, like that's going to unlock the 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 SEO growth. Um, but really, like more often than not, people just need to take. A little bit more of a step back, look at it from a top-down approach, um, and think think from first principles. Like, like why should Google rank me? Exactly. And you know, how would you feel if you searched this yourself? If you you know took that step back, all marketers should do that. How would you feel if you took that step back and you're looking for yourself and you found your site terrible content, your terrible product offering for what people are looking for, and then put yourself in the user's shoes and, and see if that makes sense. And does that align with what you see as well, Bernard, with ClearScope? Yeah, I, you know, I think a lot of people think that SEO is a bunch of check, check boxes and you go through and you check all the boxes, right? Title tag less than 65 characters, includes a meta description, blah, blah, blah. And really to echo what Eli was already saying, it's, it's not, right? It, it's a whole variety of different things. And I think that a lot of experts get, get lost in, in the trees and don't, don't see the forest. Got it. Um, one thing that you mentioned, Bernard, earlier, you, you talked about how, okay, before it used to be about link building, like that was kind of, you know, activities like that um, versus now it's much more about being a content strategist. Talk about the intersection of kind of content marketing and SEO are they inseparable at this point? How do you think about the distinction between the two? Yeah, that's a, again, a very complicated question to answer. And the best answer, of course, in most SEO contexts is it depends. So I think you're starting to see this concept of, you know, content marketing, user experience play a larger role in search engine optimization. And for a percentage of content being created on the internet, you could imagine more of what you're seeing from Wirecutter, Nerd Wallet. It's going to be infused with more content marketing, at least from what a traditional sense looks like, which is written content, you know, like good imagery, that sort of thing. I think in the broader context of, you know, content marketing, you also have on the flip side, this product led SEO component, which is not going to look mu as much like how traditional content marketing looks, right? It's like saying, how can we programmatically create pages that are going to be inherently useful for people searching for all kinds of different things that my product and service can fit. 
and you're going to have a lot of variations of technically generated pages that are are just interesting and useful that are not going to look like the long form editorial piece. So I think that you're seeing basically this blend of like good user engagement signal, user experience. And in some cases that looks like great long form written content that a lot of people would have traditionally called content marketing. But then you're also seeing the expansion of, you know, just like interesting styles of pages that people are able to create through user generated content flywheels or other initiatives that, you know, they collect a lot of data. So I think that broadly speaking, I guess the most interesting way of framing it is just like Google and users are a lot more dialed into what is actually useful and interesting content. And in some queries, that means longer form, great looking content. And in other queries, it could literally just be, you know, like more of a forum or, you know, like widget based experience. Got it. Yeah. Anything to add to that, Eli? Yeah, I, I love that. And, and I, I love the, the way of thinking about content from a perspective. And one thing I tell companies all the time when they when I tell them not to do SEO, and I'd say two thirds of the conversation I have is around not doing SEO. And then they say, well, should I just not write content? And that's a terrible question. You should write content. But the problem I think is when it comes to SEO, we'll think of the two buckets of SEO content and content. They should be one and the same. I tell companies that they should be writing content that they want to share on social media, that they want to share in their email list, and they want to share on their website that people are going to directly navigate to. And if that content generates SEO traffic, so be it. But to write content that is terrible just because it's loaded with keywords that people want to rank for or think they should rank for makes no sense. If you've written content that's stuffed full of keywords, if you've written content on Fiverr and you're too embarrassed to share it on Upwork on, on your email list or too embarrassed to to have to share it on social media, what's the point of that? That's a reflection of your business. So write content, use tools again, like ClearScope to understand what people are looking for, write that content, put it out on your email, put it on your website. And again, if it drives SEO traffic, that's great, but make it what people are looking for. If it needs imagery, then it needs imagery. Don't say, well, imagery is gonna kill the, my keyword count and it's going to break up this SEO content. There should be no such thing as SEO content. SEO is a channel to acquire users. Again, like I said earlier, if there are users there. So you don't need to do every single marketing channel just because they exist. You don't need to advertise in the Super Bowl just because it exists. You do the things that make sense for your business. And if SEO makes sense for your business, then you create the content that makes sense for your customers. And when it comes to prioritizing that content, again, I think a big mistake people make is they use SEO metrics. So they'll go on a keyword tool and they'll search by you know, they'll search their primary keyword and look for keywords with the highest volume. And that's how they'll prioritize the content they need to write. Instead, I think they should be prioritizing content by user need. So if users don't understand how your product works, that's the content you should write. If you just don't understand why you're better than your competitor, that's the content you write. And if users don't understand the value prop you have, you write their content. Don't focus on content that has that keyword and that the keyword tool told you a lot of people search because you're missing out. You know, it, SEO is about converting traffic and converting traffic is so much easier when it's someone searching you versus your competitor or what's your return policy or how fast do you ship? That's the content to write. So when you're investing in content, put that first, put the converting content first, put the content that makes sense for your audience and really don't worry about SEO metrics until later. Some, some gold nuggets from what both of y'all shared. Uh, what stood out, you know, Bernard, you really talk about Think about the query, like what is it that people really want and like what is the type of content that best serves serves that query if you were to, you know, go down the SEO route. Um, and and Eli, uh, I, I like how you just encapsulate, look, the bottom line is make the content that your customers need. Don't think so much about the volume and the traffic and all that. Like what do your customers actually need? Uh, because your content's a reflection of your business. And so those are the things that you want to actually be focusing on. Let's get more tactical here. You know, Bernard, you talked about uh, what's an int you, you talked about leveraging UGC uh, for for SEO. Um, like, what's an, an interesting example of a, of a company that you've seen uh, that's leveraged UGC uh, in, in a successful way that you're like, oh, there's there's something to learn from that. 
Yeah, I mean, on on the surface, of course, you have your your key players in in the space, which has always been TripAdvisor and and Yelp, and you know, a variety of those forum type stuff. Reddit as well, although Reddit doesn't necessarily do that well in in SEO. So I think that really there are certain queries that deserve a diverse set of opinions and those are often going to be the ones where you see these UGC websites like performing better to be completely honest I'm kind of seeing a decline though in those specific types of websites to date and they're losing to this more longer form editorial content right if you googled best lunch in Houston or Austin you're actually seeing Yelp no longer just always monopolize like the top spots. You're seeing these local food bloggers kind of rising in, in the ranks. And I think that a lot of that is maybe a semblance of this like problem that, that we're facing in terms of quality content and that like, okay, you know, most website or most um, businesses on Yelp just more or less gravitate towards like a four-star rating. <laughs> or like a four and a half, you'd have to be really bad to like, you know, be at like three or two and a half and whatnot. And what people are like more gravitating towards now is, okay, I want to know how this specific local food blogger influencer like thinks about, you know, these specific restaurants. So I think that, you know, you see UGC work really well in certain pockets and then people's tastes like may change. Perhaps e-commerce is like another one of those where there's nothing like going through and reading a bunch of, you know, reviews, photos, FAQs from people who have purchased the product, because then, you know, like, oh, yeah, like that is more likely to be like janky and, and whatnot. But I think that it's, it's always an ebb and flow and, you know, like e-commerce makes a lot of sense. Reviews made a lot of sense. And then you know, the independent food bloggers and influencers and tastemakers started creating their own like long form content to match that. And they're competing head to head with very strong authoritative websites now. Very interesting. Yeah, I didn't even realize that that was a, a trend going on. You're seeing a decline in UGC heavy sites in certain certain categories where longer editorial content's ranking higher, particularly from like tastemakers with topical uh, authority. Um, Eli, are you seeing similar things? Do you have another example of UGC uh, user-generated content uh, working well? So the interesting point is that Google actually updated this week where they're now adding discussions when relevant into search. So they're having a box where they'll pull in Quora, they'll pull in Reddit because people are looking for this kind of content. But I, a lot of times it's low quality. So you have to understand like back in the day when there were forums and if there were people dominated forums of opinions, Reddit and Quora and these other UGC platforms can be the same where they're not necessarily moderated or they're moderated with incentive like Reddit. So Google is telling you that these are discussions, but again, there's so many queries that Google automatically suggests to you that you should append the word Reddit on that query. You know, I'm looking for uh, best doctor near me, Reddit, right? They're, they're telling you Reddit's a good place to find it. They're not telling you that you could trust Reddit. So they're adding that discussion. I'd say UGC is a great place to really learn from what your users want. So if you are in, in a specific vertical, let's say you're servicing hardware, you can go on Reddit and look for ideas that seem to be repetitive, that people are asking the same question. And then you can scale it up what I love to do, which is product-led SEO. So you understand there's a user need. And when you're building a product around your SEO, you need to validate that need. And I, again, UGC is a great place to validate the need. You know, Bernard mentioned TripAdvisor. That's my favorite UGC site, and Yelp, of course, you know, from back in the day, where they were able to validate the need and then they built the architecture around it. So they're driving all this value really around their architecture. We have a hotel, we have all the hotels in every location, whether or not there's UGC, TripAdvisor works. Getting that score, whether again, whether or not there's UGC content, they still have the scores on it. So I love using, having UGC to validate ideas, to understand what people are looking for, and to really understand if there's SEO need there that you can fulfill, rather than 
well, people are querying it, so I'm just going to go after it. Like uh, the near me queries. Yes, everyone searches you know, best place to eat near me, but you don't want to write a long piece of content. Like here's all the places you're going to go near you. That's not relevant for every single uh, GPS location. So I like using UGC as, as my slug to really build off of rather than this is the place where I want to create a bunch of UGC or you know, spam UGC even. Take that further. You, we're talking about how, uh, particularly for local searches, um, having folks locally with topical authority are is that starting to, to to rank higher and higher in the SERPs. Do you uh, see now that things are going more video first, TikTok results being shown uh, uh, shown in the result uh, in uh, uh, you know on the first page of Google? Um, how should we be thinking about? video now going into uh, 2023 as that's becoming more and more important in certain categories? I, mean, I think that, that uh, again, this goes back to CEOs to just be too tactical. I think the most important thing here is to really understand what users, if video makes sense for what looking for, I think a great place you're seeing a lot more video is how to, like how to change my, my bike tire how to understand uh, if my oven is working, how to fix my dishwasher filter. Like those are things people want videos for. And therefore, if you're competing in that space, you're going to want to create video, video and text. Don't, don't, uh, don't look past the text. When it comes to, uh, you know, things that are less how to and probably don't make as much sense for video, I don't think you have to worry about it. So it really comes down to that high level view of what does the user want and create that content for the user and know that Google will be using those signals to decide that video makes more sense. I think the one thing we're gonna see is, you know, I, I, a lot of times people complain about Google being a monopoly and Google steals traffic and Google's evil. Google's not evil, Google is a for-profit business. Google is the mall, like we're, you know, we're just grateful that we have a spot in the mall and they give us free traffic. And they, at this point, they sort of have the right to not do that because they're alternatives. The one place I think Google can be evil is when it comes to YouTube. So when they're giving only you results for something, that doesn't seem right. I mean, they're driving the traffic directly to their own site that monetizes based on impression advertising. And when there's like three pages of only YouTube results, that that might not be fair. So to address that, Google has been going to TikTok, Vimeo, and other video providers to get direct feed from them, just like they get from Twitter, so they can avoid going to Congress and having to explain why there's so many results that just feed YouTube. But other than that, I would say, look at Google does surface video results for Google surfacing video results. You kind of have to have video. Meditation is one of those things that is full of video results. So in the meditation space, you might need to look at me or video or audio content in a, as a way to compete. You're not going to look like, here's a 10 step meditation you can do by reading this blog post. Eli nailed uh, that, it. What do you think Bernard? Yeah. But it's, it's exactly it. I would say to add on other types of queries where I'm seeing video have more prevalence is going to be outside of how to, of course, you Google most how to and video like a YouTube embedded video slash carousel is going to be there is like, what is <laughs> you usually see a, a video carousel for what is I do think that a lot of content creators do a fairly good job explaining what is you know, this or that and that sort of thing. And then another one I'm starting to see more of, and this kind of, you know, hinges on it, whether the review is of a consumer package good, but is review, right? So if you're, you're doing like a review of a vacuum or whatever, you're going to see a lot more video based reviews as well. And I think that's because, right, it's a lot more qualitatively useful to a user who's performing sets of searches on how to you know, vacuum cleaner review, what is that, that they're going to be more engaged with video. I'm going to just add on to this idea of, you know, Google and YouTube being like, you know, a, a monopoly and say that, you know, the most interesting thing that is happening is that classes of searches are no longer starting always on Google. So a good example of this is in e-commerce, if you're on Amazon and you're subscribed to Prime, well, you don't Google like whatever you're wanting to buy on Amazon. You just go to Amazon and you start your search there. 
So I'm going to say the same for, for video, right? There's going to be a whole, whole new classes of searches that just begin on YouTube. They begin on TikTok. And I do think that video then has a special place at least in a content strategy moving forward because, you know, Google, they might end up ranking on Google, but a lot of people might be starting their search on TikTok, on YouTube, and creating video content for those types of searches is going to meet the searcher in the medium that they care about. And, you know, you get a nice side effect bonus if it just happens to rank in Google as well. Got that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, are there any, go ahead, Eli. I was just going to say, I, I think that people get too focused on Google search and like Google algorithm updates and they're obsessed with Google when, you know, I wrote my book and I actually went and edited every time I said Google, I wrote Google and Bing and I tried to change it to search engines because I, I want my book to be relevant for all search. And I, I think it is relevant for all search. It'll take a little while to be obsolete and think about like that. Search will change. There will be other search engines and our search strategies need to account for that. So just like Bernard said, Amazon, TikTok, there are other search engines and there could be a day where TikTok actually launches its own crawler and you can do search that's not just TikTok videos. And there could be a day where Amazon launches its own crawler and you could do a search where it's not just e-commerce on Amazon. You know, Amazon has things from other stores, not just Amazon and their advertising. And Amazon has devices that you could ask questions to and they give you search results that are not e-commerce results. So very likely they could go in that direction if they, well, there's more ads we could sell if we had search results on an actual browser, you know, on a phone or a computer, they could do that. Facebook could do that too. Uh, Microsoft may one day figure out how to do Bing search properly. Again, like search is not all about Google. So if you approach search from a user perspective, Google's a medium right now, Google's a medium, but there one day be other search engines and Google's very aware of that. And that's why they're aggressive about thinking about TikTok because they know they don't own the market. You know, three years ago, you would have said Facebook is the only social media network that will ever exist. And now they're, they're not, right? So I'd say, like, think about search the same way, focus on the user, focus on how algorithms want to prioritize results. And don't think about how does the Google algorithm do things and how do I optimize against the Google algorithm or how do I find hacks and loopholes in the Google algorithm? One more question, tactical, before we uh, hop into some audience questions. We've, we're seeing the rise of AI-generated content. That is the, the topic uh, of 2022. Um, so tell me, how do you think about the role that AI tools uh, will play in the, in the content creation process? Uh, let's go with Bernard. Ooh, AI content. Yeah, I think there is a very real place in content strategy that involves AI. I think that AI is really good, at least in the way that it currently works, which is being trained on billions of records using internet data to inform the likelihood of certain words following other words. So you can imagine, right, if you asked it, who is the first president of America, it knows first president America, George Washington, just goes together. So all of that's to say, if you can imagine that AI content is based on the human knowledge of specific facts, things, you know, opinions that we collectively as human society have created, where AI content really shines is in things that everybody agrees upon, right? Like if we all say that Blue is, you know, this color that looks like the ocean and everybody can agree on that, then AI content shines. Right? And you can imagine that's usually facts, most times history, definitions, you know, those, those types of things. Where AI content, as you can imagine, starts to struggle is by providing unique perspectives because, again, those haven't been created before and or... Um, when society is very split on certain topics, right? Whether that be politics, religion, all that, all that good stuff. So if that's the case, then you can imagine that AI content would be good for just summarizing a lot of what has already happened. And those 
types of content, the people that need those types of content would really do well with AI. However, right, if you're in a more controversial field or a more quick changing field, then AI content, at least in its current form, is going to suffer because it's not able to construct as valuable thoughts and opinions on basically topics where we're disagreeing or the way that the topic is evolving is much faster than the model is, is being trained. Eli, go for it. I think when most people are referring to AI content, they're referring to, they're looking to be lazy. So uh, back in the day, so there was, uh, there was this plugin on WordPress called Caffeinated Content. And uh, this is probably 10 years ago. And it wrote AI content. It wrote terrible content, put in your, your you know, words, and it spun out content. And then you were able to rank on search and then somehow trick people into clicking your date links and your AdSense. That, that's, I think, what people are trying to accomplish with AI content today. They're not doing necessarily the smart thing Bernard's talking about where they really want to answer smart questions. They're just trying to avoid paying an actual writer. Now, if you want to do that, then you hopefully you're selling to computers. You're selling to robots who can like care about your AI content. But if you actually want to sell to users and your AI content looks like AI content, then you save your time and your money. I've seen so many sites where like the content makes no sense. And you know it's been written by AI. So therefore, you just don't trust the website, don't trust the content. So that I think that's the that's the idea is are, what are you trying to accomplish with it? Are you trying to accomplish saving money and saving time? Or are, is there something that's programmatic that you're writing and you can let the, the AI write for you because it uses source data? So it ends up being a little bit better than you probably were written manually. But I, I think a lot of AI content right now is just meant to be lazy. And that's why Google has this helpful content up. It's the same thing that's been going on forever where you, know, you have different ways of spinning it and AI is just a little bit smarter. It's harder to detect. But again, if you're a user trying to understand what something is and buy from something, and you're looking for that emotion and it's missing, you're not going to buy. Got that. Well, we've got uh, five-ish, five, ten-ish five, minutes to, to go. We're going to rapid fire through some audience questions for y'all. We're, we're going to keep uh, answers brief so we can get through as many as we can. Um, you know, one of the things that you talked about, Eli, was uh, figuring out what content your customers need um, how can you figure that out that for, you know, how, how do you actually determine like what content does your, do your customers need that isn't already out there? You know, when your market's really saturated, say you're in parenting or baby brands, it's, it's a very saturated market. How do you figure out what, uh, what content to create? Again, I, I hate to keep saying it, but users. So I, I like to do what a lot of people don't do, which is ask actual users. So if there's a you need, ask users, like, is this, you know, in parenting, is this something that you would be interested in and have those user conversations and you can get lots and lots of ideas of things that people are looking for, but they can't find. Like I said earlier, Reddit's a great place. To, you go in, don't look like the Reddit queries, actually read the Reddit comments and go through it and you'll find ideas. And if you see the same thing over and over again, that's a user need that you can build something around. There's like amazing Reddit comments that have like a thousand words, 1500 words. Those are blog posts that are basically ranking and you can like build on that and create actual better content that doesn't come from Reddit. Not saying steal it, but like use the ideas and this is something people want and they don't want to trust a Reddit comment. Here's a piece of content I could create. Yeah. Can you explain I, the difference? Uh, yeah, sorry, Bernard, we're gonna, we're gonna keep rolling. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna ask you, um, can you explain the difference between uh, Google search and Google Maps ranking? Like, is there a different SEO strategy for each? Yeah, it's basically Google search is what happens when you type in all the queries and you can imagine maps as a subset of that search. So Google understands that if you performed a search that has a localized intent, like haircut, groceries, you probably want the map instead of something. They infer that if you know, you Google groceries, they don't show you the map. And then somebody like Google's like groceries map or groceries near me. And then Google says, okay, we should probably introduce the map. Map has to do more with citations, right? Credibility, like, okay, are you actually a local business 
operating near near Austin? And if so, you know, how many sources has validated that your hours are indeed 9 a.m. to 9 p.m.? And then within that, it's based on, you know, whether you have a Google My Business account and, you know, awaiting towards reviews and overall engagement to your location when provided the in in the results. So it's a different ranking algorithm, but it is a subset of Google search. And in my opinion, it's based primarily on Google My Business Reviews, how many local citations that, that you have. Right. Localized intent, uh, match with local credibility, um, and, and through the, the medium of like Google My Business and some of those more local uh, Google options. Um, Eli, in your experience, is it better, and uh, I, I, I always, uh, I'm afraid to ask you an SEO question because I feel like you're going to be like, why are you, like, why are you asking me about SEO? <laughs> um, in your wrote a book on it, okay. <laughs> is it better to invest in high authority backlinks, but in sw a smaller quantity, or to invest in, in decent authority backlinks like DR20 to 40, but in, in larger quantity? Option C. <laughs> what is option C? <laughs> Neither. I, I backlinks are a total waste of time. Uh, I, I know I'm going to get slain comments here, but uh, Google's got 20 years of building their algorithms to detect spam. So if you're buying links just for link's sake, they can detect it. And, you know, I, I've been fortunate in that I've actually gotten backlinks from the White House three times, two or three times, whitehouse.gov, and those links did nothing. So I think the domain authority of backlinks don't really matter. It's really the context. And Google's algorithms said it earlier, they drive cars. Same company drives cars without killing anybody. They're, they can figure out backlinks are a waste of time. So invest in people, find someone to really get your message out and you'll get links. Some of those links will matter. Some of those links won't matter. But the more important thing is people know your business exists and they'll want to click on the links that you do get. And if they don't count for Google, they count for something. So don't invest in backlinks and in your business, invest in your brands. Bernard, uh, Eli said some controversial things that I want to definitely make sure that you have the ability to add context to. No, 100% on board. I mean, okay. All right. The, there are some <laughs> cases where backlinks like will help, especially if you're like just getting started. Right? I believe that Google's looking at a semblance of a variety of factors, one of which is backlinks, another of which is topical authority or how well your content, your existing content for a certain topic is performing over time. So in the very beginning stage, when you have no content that's doing well for a topic and no authority you know, from a backlink perspective, how can Google start to build trust in your website? So early on is basically the only time I will recommend doing any sort of backlink building. But once you've already proven to Google that you have content that's crawlable, indexable, and useful to users in a specific topic, I say get off the backlinks and just put it all into content. Fantastic way to, uh, to cap off the session. Any resources, um, uh, Bernard, that you would recommend people, people check out uh, when, when wanting to, to learn, uh, you know, go deeper on this stuff? Well, I mean, product-led SEO, I just put the link in the messages. You definitely want to check out this book. Eli goes above and beyond describing the strategies that he invented and crafted at SurveyMonkey, really also diving more into the tactical of, okay, how do you actually figure out how to create content that your users want? And I think that a lot of the time, SEOs aren't sitting in on sales calls. They aren't looking at the common support tickets that people are writing into the help desk center. And these are points that Eli points out all the time and is like, hey, you know, this is something that is very useful. The other one that I'm going to give is just our, our YouTube channel, ClearScope. We host awesome web speakers on SEO and content like Eli every week and we record them and we talk about all kinds of different useful, interesting things like Google EAT, what's been going on with the helpful content update. So definitely would recommend those. ClearScope's weekly webinars are awesome. They are masterclasses and they are totally free. Absolutely check them out. Definitely uh, uh, check out Eli's book. I was gonna ask you, Eli, who should not read your book? 
who are the who are the people in this audience that should skip your your book and who is who is it really for everyone should read the, my book because i think it's like six dollars on amazon and, and for some people actually two-thirds of people it's gonna be only six dollars you ever need to spend on seo and i just want to be clear that like seo is the most amazing channel and can drive so much roi if it makes sense for you and really seo is a marketing channel and i, I think again that we go back to tactics when people think about seo they think about it too narrowly and not in the context of our business the dollars you spend like bernard said earlier, ppc the dollars you spend on seo if they're better spent on PPC, spend them on PPC. Why would you spend them on SEO? So I, again, I like to think about SEO as a marketing channel. Does it make sense and where's it most effective? I don't want to think it very narrowly in the sense of like, I need to check this box. The agency said it costs $5,000 a month. I'm going to pay $5,000 a month. It's really, is that $5,000 a month better spent on a PR agency? Is it better spent on having another engineer? Is it better spent on PPC? So really think about it in the broad context of the business. And then within SEO, where do you focus those efforts? Do you focus it on PR? Do you focus on writing more content? Do you focus on building a better product? So again, I like to think about everything high level, whether it makes sense. And you know, when I had mentioned page speed earlier, that's something that's expensive. Where are those resources better spent? If that's the last thing that you can fix, spend it on page speed, but there's always something else and something better. So hopefully those ideas come through in the book. You know, anyone can get some idea out of it you know, read the book and hopefully if you don't need SEO, it's the only money you ever spend on SEO. Spend six bucks, you will validate whether or not SEO is the right fit. Uh, it's kind of a no brainer, absolutely recommend it. Um, Bernard Wong's product is clearscope.io. If you haven't checked it out, you absolutely must. It is the premier, uh, if you're writing content and have any sort of SEO angle, it is the tool to use. We use it every day at Demand Curve. Uh, for all of our content, absolutely recommend it. Um, check them out in the booths, the virtual booth. Um, I know there's a, a special that ClearScope has going on uh, for, for some free reports if you want to, uh, to pop in there. Um, where can people uh, reach out to you? How can they connect to, uh, with, with y'all after, after the summit? They want to keep going down, learning more about uh, the uh, uh, Bernard and Eli-verse. Well, I also want to shout out ClearScope. ClearScope is the best tool I know for really understanding what users want. And you're writing manual content. Not You're not writing AI content. You understand the and you write for them. <laughs> Absolutely. How can people get in touch? I, I dropped my Twitter in, in the messages. I think that'll be the easiest place for me to, to connect with y'all. If you have questions, thoughts, things, you know, feel free to at message both me and Eli. I'm sure you know why they're debated out or have interesting viewpoints that you you can you can have. So I know we didn't get around to all the other Q and A's, but you know, ping ping me on on Twitter. Is that also a good place for you, Eli? So Twitter, LinkedIn, my website. I drop my email address. The last thing I would say on finding me is SEO is about vis complete visibility for you. So it show up however you show up so i don't need to tell you to like you know go specifically my linkedin google me the places i want to show up and have visibility those are all, all there and i trust them all fantastic uh, what, a, what a great way to end uh well thank you all both so much uh for spending your time with us today um this was super Every, drop, drop some love in the chat uh, i want uh, what, get, give back to the, the speakers who just uh, were so generous with their with their time here i mean i learned a lot um, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Eli has, has abandoned Bernard and I, we, uh, you know, we're, we're Texan, uh, Texan boys. Bernard is in Austin and I'm in Houston and Eli just, uh, uh, abandoned us for, for California, but we're not going to, going to hold that against him. Um, for, uh, you know, just cause he gave such a great session. We'll, we'll let him slide. <laughs> thank you. Awesome. Adam. Yes. Appreciate you both. Uh, I will see you both backstage. We're going to start the, uh, next session at the top of the hour. Bell Curves VP of Marketing, Raf, will be uh, kicking off that uh, on newsletter growth.